in salvation by grace through faith, rebaptized people who were sprinkled, rebaptized people who had never made a personal decision to receive Christ. If you don't get saved first, then you need to be baptized again after you get saved. Philip said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And, G, and, and, the, and or, or the Ethiopian eunuch said to Philip, what doth, see here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So he's saying, can, we, can you baptize me right here? And Philip's answer was, if thou believest, thou mayest. Got to believe in Jesus first. Got to trust him by faith first. Then you can get baptized. In the great... Pentecostal revival. The great message of Peter preached and 3,000 people responded to the gospel. When they came forward, the Bible says, then they that gladly received his word, they got saved, trusted Christ, had the joy of the Lord, were baptized, and it says, and the same day they were added unto them. About 3,000 souls. Now, doing the math, that's about 250 people per, per apostle. That's a heap of a lot of people to baptize. What a wonderful thing. 120 to 3,120 in one day. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be wonderful? We, we, where would we put them? You say, where would we put them? We, with 3,000 people, we'd just write the, write the ticket for a new building. Just buy a new building. See, God, God is in the soul-saving business. And God is the, Jesus Christ is the head, and we're to look to Him for all leadership. So we're to build upon the, the church upon Him. We're to look to Him for leadership. We're to keep Him preeminent. That word preeminent is found in this verse that we just read, Colossians 1.18, the second part of the verse. It says, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. What does that word mean? The word preeminent means first in rank. He's the captain of our salvation. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, alpha, omega. First in dignity, first in honor, First in power. So in other words, the ministry, the high priority of our ministry, and the focal point of our ministry should be all about Jesus. Everything about Jesus. Nothing else. The Corinthian church, baby Christians, taught the teenagers this this morning. They were so carnal, so worldly, that Paul couldn't preach to them the meat of the word. He said, I can only, I can only give you milk. I, I, I told the kids, I said, what if, what if you were in, in school, in the lunchroom, at your junior high or high school, and there's a, a kid that opens up his lunch pail. He's got a sandwich, he's got a snack, and he pulls out a bottle. Is that, going to be, is that going to be kind of unusual to you? I mean, he's got a bottle. He's got a, a, you know, a baby's bottle. He's got milk in it, and he's drinking it. Um, hello? <laughs> Don't think that's normal. And so the Corinthians were babes. They'd never grown up. And Paul says in, in part of the, the book of 1 Corinthians, he said, I preached Christ and him crucified. And that was basically it. Now look, folks, if you're going to preach anything, preach about Jesus. You're going to start anywhere, and nobody can, and people can't get any farther than, any, than that, then that's what you stick with, that's what you preach. I believe it was Charles Spurgeon once that preached seven times in a row, or maybe it's, I think, I think it was D.L. Moody. He preached seven times, seven services in a row on John 3.16. A member came to him and says, isn't there anything else in the Bible? Don't you think you could preach anything else? He says, when you get that, then I'll change the subject. Hey, this is not the only time where they had, this, they, they had that type of trouble. 
Jesus is to be preeminent. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. I shared this with our young people today. I had a young couple, not the same couple I was talking about, I went to lunch with, and whose father was an atheist, and, and he's, he's a wonderful Christian young man. But another young couple I went to see, had, had seen him for a while, and, and <clears throat> in talking to them, we got off on the subject of holiness. We talked about the, this world and how worldliness has crept into the church and, and, he, and, and the dissension and all the stuff that goes on with that. And he made it. I, I, I really thought his, what, he, what he said was very profound. He said, Pastor, isn't it interesting how when people disagree with positions on whatever, from music to standards to whatever, how that when they disagree, instead of being holier and wanting to be more like God, they want to be unholier and go away from God. Now, I'd never, that came from a layman, and I'd never heard that, and a young man. Look, the young get it, folks, just like the older people. We don't need to be more like the world. We don't need to be more like this evil place. If anything, if we're going to err on the side of anything, we ought to err on the side of being holy. I think when we get to heaven, we're going to be surprised. The Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. By the way, Paul spoke from first-hand experience. Paul wasn't afraid of anything or anyone. And Paul had it in his head that Christian, Christianity, that every Christian was an enemy of God. Very similar to what the Arab community feels right now. And Paul was on his way to the Damascus Road, and when he met Jesus, when he met the Savior, when Jesus Christ struck him down on the Damascus Road, believe me, he was in terror. And he said, what will thou have me to do? There was no argument. He was blind for three days. And don't you think he was like Jonah? Paul could say at the end of his life, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. You know why? Because Jesus was preeminent. He said, at the end of my life, I want to be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. The righteousness which is of, of, of the law by faith, or the righteousness which is of Christ by faith. He said, I want to be found in Him. This verse here, Paul wrote, not I, but Christ. That's what we need to be thinking about every day. It's not about me. Ministry's not about me. Life's not about me. It's about Jesus. Then in closing, I know we're past time. We're to follow what he says. Turn to, Col turn to Matthew 7 and we'll be done. Just spend a little bit of time here. Matthew 7 and verse 24. Here's what he says. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. Heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. I will liken him, liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. As the foundation of the church, we're to build the church upon Him. As the foundation of the church, we're to look to Him for leadership. As the foundation of the church, we're to keep Him preeminent in every area of our life. Our focus 
is to be upon him, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The next verse is, For consider him, who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. We've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. And then we're to follow what he says. We have 1,189 chapters. I don't know how many words. A guidebook for life. To show us how to build this ministry. To show us how to build our homes. To show us how to live our lives. This is why he gave it to us, not so we could just bring it here on Sunday. We don't just have this so that we can have it for a Sunday school class. Or we can even have it just to preach. He gave it to us to read. Study to show thyself. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, Jesus asked his disciples one day, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? What do you say? I wonder what they said. They probably said nothing. <laughs> Just a question. It's a question we ought to, all ought to ask ourselves. Why do we call him Lord and not do what he says? Our Father, we ask this, morning, this evening, you would soften our hearts. Help us reevaluate the direction of our lives. Help us understand that the foundation of the church is Jesus. I'm not sure where, what particular area that you've spoken to us here. But I pray that you'd help us to do some business with God tonight. Let's stand. Doug's chosen a song of invitation. And